with us today as we continue to celebrate God's faithfulness. your prom 
you believe it? Shout amen, somebody. All of his promises, yes and amen. Every good, perfect gift, the Bible says, comes from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That just simply means he doesn't change his mind, and he's always bright, and he's always perfect, and there's no shadow, there's no defect, there's no flaw. There may be flaws in us, but I want you to know we have a treasure in our earthen vessel. We have a godly inheritance. We are bound for heaven. God has done great things in our lives, and the best is yet to come. I wish somebody would shout amen. Hallelujah. Welcome, welcome, welcome this morning. We're so glad you're with us today. Um, I want us to pray together and just lift up needs and, and problems and issues and sickness and all the things that concern our lives. Well, trust, let me say something to you. Trust me now when I say this. God is concerned about what concerns you. He says, cast all your cares on me. Why? Because I care for you. He cares for you. He cares what's happening in your world, what's happening in your life. Brokenness, sorrow, shame, embarrassment, uh, guilt. I'm gonna say, I just want to say to you, God is in the business of forgiving and healing and restoring. And this morning, if you'll receive what he has for you, He'll do great and mighty things. You believe that? Father, in Jesus' name, we lift up our issues and our problems and to you. Lord, you said if we would call on you, that you would hear and you would answer and show us great and mighty things that we know not of. So today, Lord, we call on you. Whether we're in this room or whether we're watching this, this uh, video live or some other time during the week, we know there's no distance in prayer. We know that you hear and answer prayer. We know, Lord, that you incline yourself and lean down and listen to the child of God who's calling on you in the name of Jesus, your beloved son. So it's in his name that we pray today. Lord, we come against sickness and disease. We bind the powers of hell. Lord, we pray that, that poverty would be broken off of your people and the new jobs and raises and pay and promotions and unexpected blessings and bonuses would come our way as the people of God. We receive your favor today, Lord. With government officials, we receive your favor with our family. We receive your favor, Lord, at school, in the college campus, as school starting back on the high school campus, the junior high, the, the grade school. Lord, we believe you for great and mighty things as we launch in this new uh, school year, this fall season upon us. Lord, we're trusting you now for revival, for a refreshing, for a stirring in this church and in all of the Bible teaching uh, Christ exalting churches in Ada, Oklahoma. Lord, if they're preaching life, if they're speaking life, if they're blessing you, then bless them, I pray, with great revival in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> May the community be, be impacted by what you're doing in our personal lives and we'll give you the praise and we'll thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Everybody said amen. Give him a hand clap of praise somebody. Would you do that? <clears throat> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Did you know originally in the Bible, uh, God teaches us to clap your hands over your people and shout into God with the voice of triumph. So applause is originally a form of worship. Long before uh, we started clapping for everything in our culture, uh, it was intended to bless the Lord. So what do we do with the psalmist said? Let's clap our hands and shout into God with a voice of triumph. In other words, give him a victory cry. Are you ready? Here we go. Come on, let's clap our hands and shout. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Glory to God. Glory to God, somebody. Hallelujah. Well, he's on the throne and he's answering prayer. You believe that? Amen, amen. You may be seated for a moment. Um, <clears throat> we are, uh, during, this, uh, during this season that we're kind of uh, re-gearing re and firing back up, uh, we're, we're eliminating our, our meet and greet for now. We're not going around and shaking hands and hugging necks, although I absolutely love to do that. And uh, I'm, I'm bending the protocol just a little bit, Lisa, because I love to hug somebody. But anyway, we'll, we'll not do that this morning because some folks are not comfortable with everybody coming by. So why don't you do this for me? We have now been seated. Some up here, some over here, some over here. So since we're seated, why don't we do a seat and greet this morning, all right? That means just turn around, find somebody, get eye contact with them, just give them the biggest smile you've got and wave and and tell them you love them, and say, amen, that's great, thank you. <clears throat> that is fantastic. We want to prepare at this time our morning tithe and offering, and if you're watching us online and uh, you want to support uh, the work of the Lord here through Life Community Church, 
then you can simply go to our website. It's uh, Life623, L-I-F-E 623, which, uh, by the way, I found out uh, recently that we have uh, a lot of our sermons on the website now in audio form. So it's a podcast, and I didn't even know it, Michael, but I'm a podcaster. There I am. I'm, I'm doing it. So all you got to do is go to life623.com and uh, click on media, and where it says podcast, you hit it, and you can listen to your favorite preacher anytime. Okay, there I am. We're on the, we're on the web, but, but, but do help us through giving today. Um, also, uh, not only is this video on Facebook, it's also going to be on YouTube in just a little while. We can't go live at the same time, but later on we post it to YouTube. Um, and so you can watch it there. You can share it with a friend. Uh, subscribe to that channel. That'll help us a great deal. Go there and like it, okay? But anyway, the, the beauty of this is we can share what God's doing electronically. Amen. You don't have to try to, you know, somebody at work like, well, let's see, the preacher said, uh, what did he say? I can't remember everything. All you got to do is just send them the message, all right? Really, really simple uh, if you're online. And so help us by doing that. In fact, if you're home right now or, or wherever you are watching, take a moment and like the service and, uh, and send the message, share the message with someone. And uh, I think they have this thing called watch party too. I don't know, maybe you know how to do it at home on Facebook, but you start a watch party and that, that lets folks know that you're watching uh, the service today. What a great day this is. Thank you for being here with us. We've got some friends here this morning from Tecumseh. We've got some friends here from West Texas, well, almost West Texas, I guess. Is Henrietta considered West Texas? It's Texas. We're glad you're here. And uh, it's good to have Autumn back from the southeastern Oklahoma area. He's going to college and back in town for school. And let's see, did I miss anybody? Bing, Stratford, Stonewall, Pickett. Pickett's in the house. Anybody here? Who did I miss? Oh, Pam's here from Texas. Hi, Pam. Oh, my. And also Nathaniel and Cassidy are here uh, visiting with uh, Jeff and Sherry. And, and we had a great time yesterday. We got to go to the open house with these guys at Conowall. We moved Sherry a little bit closer. Uh, I say we. They moved a little bit closer. So now they're in the Conowa area instead of North Texas. Nah, it's a whole bunch better, Jeff. So <laughs> I tell you, Jeff and Sherry have just done an incredible job on this, this house they moved into. And so we love these guys. Appreciate them so, so very, very much. So anyway, uh, right now it's time to get our offering ready. So if you're giving by cash or check, use the envelope in front of you. Um, if you're giving online, I've already told you how to do that. If you'd like to just text with your phone, uh, there's a number on the screen. You simply text the word give. Once you've set up with your bank information uh, in, in this account, then you can text at any time. Just uh, send your offering that way and uh, just a really handy way to do that. But, but may the Lord bless you now as, as you give today. This is a wonderful time uh, for us to share in God's work. So today we support our mission works. Today we support our local works. We need your help. We appreciate your faithfulness to God's house and God's work. I'm going to ask our ushers to come and they're just going to wait on you and receive the... Uh, the, the tithe, the offering in your envelopes today. And uh, then we'll also give you a moment to kind of log on and give however you're giving today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Father, today we are thankful for the opportunity to give, the privilege to give. Um, we recognize, Lord, this is part of our uh, Christian service and uh, so with joy in our hearts we share in your work we thank you Father for opportunities like this we pray that every home and every family would be blessed every job every uh, uh, place of employment Lord may places of employment be blessed simply because we're there simply because we have a covenant relationship with you and you promised blessings on our lives receive now our tithe uh, and offering in Jesus name amen amen all right, I'm going to ask our uh, worship team to continue. They've got a couple more songs they're going to lead you in. And so uh, as soon as you're able to do so, would like to do so, then please stand and uh, let's worship the Lord and sing along with uh, Sherry and the team. Let's worship God together.
of the goodness of God. Sing this with me all my life. Do I? 
And I grew up hearing my dad sing this one, if you remember it. It says, God is so good. God is so our voices. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's bless the Lord together. Just lift your voice, lift your hands, and give Him glory this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We exalt you. We thank you for your goodness. You're a good Father. A Father who loves, a Father who cares. A loving Father never does anything to hurt or damage His children. He won't reject us when we come to you. You're always... Uh, you always have time for us. You're never too busy for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Everyone said amen. Amen. God bless you as you're seated today. Amen. Um, this Thursday night, a um, very special time in the Lord. Uh, let's see, is that the 20th? Am I getting that right? Here it is. The ladies are gathering in the cafe this uh, Thursday night at 6 p.m. All right, so make note of that, please. Put it in your calendar. All ladies are invited. None of the guys, just the ladies. And it's interesting that the ministry uh, Glenda began years ago is called Let's Talk. I don't know why that's associated with women's ministry, but anyway, there'll be a great time of sharing and fellowship. Uh, Heather, wave, wave at us, sis, sissy. Come on up here, everybody kind of see. This is my, my lovely daughter. I've got three wonderful daughters. This is the baby, Heather. And Heather's going to be, uh, she's putting together some food. We sent out some notices about all the food and, and uh, the gathering. So you don't have to bring anything except yourself. All the ladies come on out at 6 on Thursday evening for a time of fellowship and uh, sharing around the Word of God. It's going to be really, really good. All right? So I need all the boys and girls who are to go upstairs to come on and make your way up the stairs. All right? Some are already there going. So the rest of you cats, just go this way if you are 4 through 11. There you go. And have a great time upstairs. Give our kids a hand, everybody. We appreciate them. Love them. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. It's the sound of thunder you're hearing there. It's holy thunder, we call it. I am uh, currently in the midst of a series on the end times entitled The King is Coming or The Second Advent of Christ or Jesus' Return, whatever you want to call it. We're talking about the second coming of the Lord. And anytime you talk about Bible prophecy and the future, uh, it gets exciting. And someone would say, well, why do we want to talk about that? What's the importance of that? Um, may I just share with you a few reasons to, to preach uh, Bible prophecy? Number one, prophecy is a major part of divine revelation. In fact, in your Bible, 28% of the Bible was prophecy at the time it was given. That means believers uh, have to understand something about prophecy to, uh, to interpret and understand the message of the Bible. 28% was prophecy when it was given. Number two, the second reason, there's a special blessing that is placed on those who study prophecy. It's promised to us and pay attention to what it says. In, in fact, in the book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible... Um, it records the, the consummation of God's program for man and for the world. And when you think of Bible prophecy, sometimes the first book you think of is Revelation. In Revelation 1-3, the Bible uh, says God promises a special blessing. And he says, God blesses the one who reads the prophecy to the church. And he blesses all who listen to it and obey what it says. So that's the only book in the Bible that contains this specific, unique promise. 
is when you study or hear or, or, or digest uh, teaching about Bible prophecy or eschatology, which is, which is the study of the end times, then there's a blessing attached to that from God himself. Number three, the third reason is that God himself, Jesus himself is the subject of prophecy. Jesus Christ is the subject of prophecy. Theologians have frequently noted that Jesus is the center of theology because all of the great purposes of God depend on his person and on his work. So what is true of theology in general is especially true of eschatology. Revelation 19 and 10 says, for the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness to Jesus. So that's what prophecy does. It gives a clear witness to Jesus. And if there's no clear witness to Jesus, then, then we're just spinning our wheels. We're just wasting our time. I don't want to hear about, uh, you know, who's going to be the Antichrist and, and who's going to be your, your, your wife in the, in the afterlife. I don't want to hear about all that. I want to hear what testifies of Jesus. And so, so when I bring you Bible prophecy, we talk about it, it's always going to lift up the Lord Jesus. Number four, the fourth reason we study Bible prophecy is prophecy gives a proper perspective in life. It's important because it tells us the end of the story. It tells us where we're going. It reveals that just as our world has a definite beginning, in Genesis 1-1, it will have a definite ending. And this world will not continue on forever through infinite cycles of history. History is not an endless recurrence of reincarnation or karma or birth or life and death. Bible prophecy reveals to us that there is an end. There's an end to this age. There's an end to this planet. And there's a, God has specifically designed it that way. He has timed it in his own timing. He's, told, he's, he's recorded it. He's put it in the book of God for us to study and for us to glean from and to gain revelation. And it places a proper perspective in our lives. Number five, the fifth reason we study Bible prophecy is that it can and should be used as a tool for evangelism. A tool for evangelism. You know, it's amazing. All the people that you know who... Um, are born again, so many of them started uh, their sincere study of God and following the scriptures through Bible prophecy. My friend uh, uh, Robert Shirtliff, Robert and Michelle moved just about, oh, what was that, a month ago or six weeks ago or something, maybe two months. They've moved to Choctaw. We lost those guys. Man, it was so sad to see them go. But, but Robert is my friend, and we we're always talking about Bible prophecy, and he likes to teach on eschatology. And he tells me, he says, that's where I really started to follow Christ. He said, I was just floundering around in college and not real serious about my walk with the Lord. And he said, I got hold of, of uh, Tim LaHaye's book uh, on, on the, the end times. And, and he says, I think it was late great planet earth or something like that. And uh, he, so he was, he was studying and he was reading and that's what birthed him into the walk he's in today was Bible prophecy. And that story is repeated over and over and over. So, so Bible prophecy helps us to understand our world today it reveals the sovereignty of God over time and history. It proves the truth of God's word. And finally, it is given to change the way we live today. Listen, the apostle Paul said, he that has this hope in him purifies himself. What hope? That blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus. I know because Jesus is coming one of these days, I want to keep myself pure. I want to walk before him in holiness. I want to live the life he's called me to live because I know Jesus is coming back again. Can you say amen to that? All right. So let's jump into our, our message for the, for the day. And uh, I've been teaching this on Sunday mornings and then on Wednesday nights. Uh, what we do on Wednesdays is we pre-record um, for the week ahead. And then we, we launch them. We, it's called Premiere on Facebook. So 6.30 is Wednesdays. You can get a live Facebook uh, post. And it looks like I'm live. And I'm really not live. So don't be... Uh, just made over that. What we've done is we've re recorded it, and uh, you can still get a watch party going. You can still share it with your friends. We've got a lot of folks who are following our connection on Wednesday night. We look at the views, and we look at the people who've clicked on, and, and it's amazing. It's amazing how folks are being touched. So, so, so take a look at Sunday mornings, which is always on there. It'll be archived, and then take a look at Wednesday nights as well. But it's, it's a challenge for me because I'm preaching this one this one theme, and I'm trying to remember where I left off last. So if I repeat some stuff this morning, you'll know that the Holy Spirit wanted it repeated. You'll know that he just wanted you to hear it a second time, all right? So bear with me and be patient with me uh, today as we go into uh, our message for, for the day. I want you to do something with me. Do you mind? Would you stand, everybody? And uh, I want us to pray together. 
over this message and over your life and over our church. And, and let's pray specifically for those little guys that came up here a moment ago. And for some of our college students and high school students, uh, this is a, the start of school for a lot of kids. And boy, is it different this year. And it's really confusing and a lot of turmoil. But you know what's something? God works mysteriously. He works wonderfully in the midst of turmoil. How many in this room have walked through a time of trouble and difficulty and God showed himself great for you? Say amen. Amen. He does things for us at those times. He doesn't do it any other time in our lives. So, so right now I want us to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray you would bless the reading and preaching of your word. Cause every heart to be open, Lord, and receptive to what you want to say to us. May our minds be clear in the name of the Lord. And Father, we pray for all students who are starting back to school, whether it's online, whether it's homeschooling, whether it's uh, uh, half at home and half in the classroom, whether it's completely in the class, however, however it's happening in their life, Lord, bless our students abundantly. Protect them, keep them safe. Let, let wisdom be theirs. May parents and families be, be graced by your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated, if you will, please. I want to begin our, our study in the book of Revelation on the second coming of Christ in Revelation chapter 19. I'd like to go there, if you'd go there with me, to verse number 12. Verse 12 of Revelation 19. Verses 12 and 13 give us a description of Christ. Now, so far we've talked about the advent, which is the second coming. We've talked about uh, the designation of Christ. Uh, now we're going to talk about the description of Christ. This is what he looks like when he comes back the second time. Now, you remember when he came the first time, he was a babe, just a little baby. Uh, his mother, Mary, had given birth, and they had taken the little baby, wrapped him, swaddled him up real tight like you do babies, and they laid him in a bed. Where's the bed? We don't have a bed. Oh, there's a manger, a manger that the cows eat out of, and, and, the, and the, the camels or the donkeys, whoever they led into the house in that particular part of the house, and they laid him in a manger because there was no room anywhere else, and so that's where they laid the little baby, but he came as a baby. He came in human form, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, he had always existed. Jesus has always existed. The Son of God has existed always with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. He's never been created, all right? There, there's a major religion today, if you want to call it a religion, it's really a cult, and they teach that Jesus was created. There was a time when God the Father made Jesus. I want to tell you something. That is heresy from the pit, Jesus was not manufactured, he wasn't made, he is begotten of the Father, the only begotten of the Father. And so he's always existed with God the Father. It's always been God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three in, in, in the Trinity have always existed. However, Jesus, the Word, the expression, the thought of God, the Logos, came to this earth, this planet, for the purpose of living a life of flesh. He became flesh and dwelt among us. He was altogether God. He was altogether man. He wasn't a man God. He wasn't half and half. He was altogether God, altogether man. Preacher, explain that. I don't know that I can explain it. Let me give you another illustration. He was divinity wrapped, get this, in a cloak of humanity. All right? And so you couldn't always see the fact that he was divine. You couldn't always see what was happening on the inside of him. He just looked like another guy. But let me tell you something. He was not another guy he is God in the flesh, and he dwelt among us. And he lived as a loving uh, shepherd to the flock. He taught the parables of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He did all these wonderful things. They nailed him to a cross because of all that. And uh, he died a, a sinner's death for mankind. Not his own sin, but for your sin and for my sin. But that's not the end of the story. They took him down off the cross. They placed him in a borrowed tomb because they just needed it for the weekend. <laughs> he didn't need the tomb for very long. They laid him in the tomb and on the third day he rose from the dead. Somebody say amen. amen. So that's what he looked like from the time he was born to the time he died. 33 years he looked like any other human being. But now I want to direct your attention to Revelation 19 and 12. This is what it, he looks like when he comes back the second time. Not at the rapture. We're not talking about the rapture this morning. Remember the rapture uh, is, is uh, the rapture is imminent. In other words, there are no prophecies that need to be fulfilled for the rapture to occur. 
It could happen now. It could happen before we leave the room. It could happen tomorrow, the next day. The rapture. What is the rapture? It's when we're caught away. Those of us who are believers in Christ, we make up the bride of Christ, and he will catch us away. He will snatch us away, and he will take us to be with him for seven-year earth, earth time is seven years. Then after that period, he comes again, and we come with him. Here's what he looks like. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, and he was clothed with a robe that was dipped in blood. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. Look at verse 13. He is clothed in a robe that is dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Now the eyes of the Lord are described as a flame of fire. There's, there are three instances in Scripture where, where we have this description of his eyes. They're all in the book of Revelation. I just read one, Revelation 19. Revelation 1.14, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes were like a flame of fire. John, the revelator who wrote these words, could barely look on Christ. He was so magnificent. His splendor was so bright. He could barely look on him. The glory of the Lord <laughs> was, was upon him, you see. It's that same glory when, when the angel appeared to the shepherds to announce the coming of Jesus. The Bible says the, the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them. And they were sore afraid. Well, you'd be sore afraid too if this, this, this light brighter than the sun lights up the dark wilderness, in the Judean wilderness where you're out there with your sheep minding your own business about half asleep and all of a sudden the glory of the Lord appears. And in the heavens there are millions and perhaps trillions of angels, heavenly beings that surrounded this annunciation angel Gabriel who brought them the testimony that Jesus Christ, the Lord of, God, of glory, was born in this particular day. What a message that angel brought. But what glory accompanied the angel. My goodness, it was magnificent. You can't describe what it was like. And it was this glory that, that accompanies Christ when he returns. I'm telling you, every eye is going to see him. Men are going to recognize him. They're going to know who he is. And his eyes are like flames of fire because they pierce through the heart of man. Revelation 2 and 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, Right, these things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. So we have three references in the book of Revelation, to eyes that are full of fire. A vivid reminder of his omniscience, the fact that he knows everything. His eyes will pierce through the motives of nations as he judges the sheep nations and the goat nations. They will, his eyes will, will pierce the heart of men. And when men look upon him and they see these eyes, they're immediately going to be moved in their hearts and they're going to be convicted of their sin and they're going to know what, it likes, what it's like to be judged by the Lord Jesus. Now the crowned head is a picture of his sovereignty as king of kings and lord of lords. His robe dipped in blood reminds us that he's the lamb of God. The lamb of God. Later on in um, Revelation 13 and 8, John describes him as the lamb slain, what? From the foundation of the earth. That word foundation doesn't mean being built. That means overthrow. The world doesn't mean planet. It means a cosmos. It's taken from cosmos, uh, a, a, a term referring to a social order. There was an overthrow of a social order before this earth was created. And Jesus was the Lamb of God slain before that even occurred. In the mind of God, in the mind of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus was the Lamb of God that was slain. It didn't happen... God didn't just say, oh, what do I do now? They've captured Jesus and they're holding him. They're going to kill him. I guess I better make his blood count for something. No, in the mind of God, the blood that Jesus was to shed, he was slain before the overthrow of the first social order. Now, I don't have time to go into all that, but it's an interesting study in itself that there was a pre-Adamite world, a world that existed before Adam and Eve. It existed before the planet that we, the, the, the structure of the planet as we know it now. And this particular verse bears that out. But Jesus was slain even before that. And it will be as the Lamb of God that Jesus is represented to us throughout eternity. An extended communion service, if you will, as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Every time we look on him, we see his robe dipped in blood. And it's a reminder we will never forget that he was slain for us on the cross. We will never forget that we are in heaven with him. We'll never forget we have this, this eternity that's been promised to us as we 
uh, celebrate with the Lord Jesus. Now that's what his uh, uh, description is. Let's, let's move a little further into the armies of Christ. Revelation uh, chapter 19, verse 14 speaks to us of the armies in heaven. Now, <clears throat> armies may not be a proper word because the people and the folks and the angels and all the creatures uh, who follow Christ from heaven to earth for the second coming, we're not going to fire a shot. We're not going to unsheath a sword. We're, we're not going to crank up the cannons. We are not going to fight in this army. Jesus Christ goes before us and he is a mighty man of war and out of his mouth comes a weapon that destroys his enemies. But here's what the army looks like, verse 14. They're arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. White, pure, fine linen. That's representative of us, the saints of God. There's a real interesting uh, book I read, I don't know, years and years ago. Um, a lady in the uh, 1800s, a godly woman died and she went to heaven and she talked about her experience. Now, I don't believe every experience I hear of heaven. I, you know, I just, I mean, I kind of take it with a grain of salt. Um, however, it has happened before. It's happened in the Bible. Um, the Apostle Paul, he, he left his body, was, was taken to the third heaven. And uh, he saw things that we, we can't, he, he said, they're not even lawful for me to describe them and tell them to you. I can't even do that. So I don't know if this lady really had this experience or not, but, but here's, here's her story. She said, I went to heaven, I was greeted by a loved one. And one of the first things he did was he took me to the river of life. It was this beautiful, clear river you could see down all the way through it. Beautiful stones and everything was glimmering and glistening. And said, come on. And he started walking into the water. And she said, wait, I can't do that, I'll drown. He said to her, he said, we don't do that here. <laughs> we don't drown here. So she's, she walked with him and they walked until they got deeper and deeper and the water got over her head. And she discovered she was breathing just fine. And they were laughing and talking. And then they started walking up the other side of the river and the water got lower and lower and she came out of the water. She was perfectly dry. Her hair was dry, her clothing was dry. But one thing she noticed, she had a white robe a white linen robe. The robe of life was given to her. The robe of righteousness was given to her. You see, I believe the rewards we have, the crowns, the robes, all the blessings God has for us, we receive when we get there. He's, he's reserved those for us. And, and what a glorious day, whether her, whether her story is true or not, the Bible teaches us we have white linen clothing on, a robe, if you will, that is significant of those who are the righteousness of God in Christ. So when all the other creatures in heaven look at us, they see us in white robes, they'll know that one was born again. That one was a child of God. That one has the righteousness of God. That one had right standing with God. They will know who we are by the robes we're wearing. Then the Bible goes on to say they followed him on white horses, heavenly horses. I think maybe heavenly horses have saddles and stirrups designed that you can't fall off. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe you're just, you're just because otherwise I don't know about riding horses, but, but we're going to ride these horses and not worry about falling off. Somehow, Jude chapter, excuse me, Jude 14, that's verse 14. There's only one chapter in Jude. Verses 14 and 15 declare. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints. All right, Jude 14, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly, among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I want you to take that verse, if you're looking at it on your phone or your tablet or your writing notes, I want you somehow to underline that, somehow highlight that, or emphasize that verse. I want you to look at that verse. Because in that verse, there are four references to the word ungodly. Ungodly. Jesus is coming with 10,000s of his saints. That's us. He's coming to execute judgment on all. To convict all who are ungodly. He's not coming to convict us. He's coming to convict the ungodly. Among them, of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Read that. Let's see the, the 15th verse. You guys have it up there for us. Thank you very much for putting that there. Can folks see that 15th verse? 
all right, to judge everyone and convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness. Now, this, this translation that we have on the screen is a little different than what I'm reading from, but I want you to see the use of the word ungodly. It's ungodly sinners, it's ungodly people, it's ungodly deeds who are living and committing them in an ungodly way. So in one, one short verse, Jude uses the word ungodly numerous times. It's not an accident. It's meant to remind us that when Jesus comes the second time, it will be primarily a time of judgment upon those who deserve judgment. He's not coming to judge us. We're coming with him. We've already been in heaven. We've already experienced some of the rewards. We've already had a glimpse of the glory of God. We've already seen what all is designated, lined up for us in eternity, what our destiny is beyond this, this life that we lived here. Let me tell you something. This life is simply preparation for the life that is to come. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I said this life is preparation for the life that is to come. Amen. 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 <laughs> Woo. See, by the time Jesus comes, the world will have rejected the ministry of the Jewish evangelist that are, have a seal on their head and they're marked of God and they're Messianic Jews, 144,000 of them. I believe that's 12,000 out of every one of the 12 tribes. These Jewish evangelists will go through, throughout the earth preaching primarily to the Jews because, listen, God wants every Jew to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But his, his grace has a limited time. His, his mercy has a limited time. There's coming a day of judgment. There's coming a day when he will act as a judge and he will he'll pronounce judgment upon all who rejected him. During the tribulation period, while the wrath of God is poured out, these Jewish evangelists will be going and trying to win souls. There will actually be two witnesses who I believe are Elijah and Enoch. They will be, uh, they'll preach in the streets of Jerusalem. They'll be killed. Their bodies will lay on the streets of Jerusalem for three days. Then they'll be miraculously raised from the dead. And they're coming. Why are they coming? To preach salvation to the lost, the ungodly, those who are without Christ, those of our neighbors and our friends, our family who've rejected Jesus. Listen, your family's not going with you in the rapture just because you're going. Your kids are not going to be saved to go to heaven just because you're saved and going to go to heaven. They have to make a, 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 a right uh, pronouncement of Christ. They have to make a decision to follow him on their own. You this evening or this morning, my friend, or evening, whenever you're watching this, it's not enough for your wife to be saved, sir. You cannot go to heaven on her coattails. You can't, you're, you're not going to make it into eternity as a child of God simply because you have a Christian wife or Christian husband or because you're born in America. Well, I'm, I'm an American, so I'm a Christian, right? Huh. Huh. Well, let me ask you this. I, I knew of, a, I knew of a, a dog one time, and she was going to have pups. And she went out in the back of the house. She climbed up in an old, old stove, an old oven that was just sitting out on the back porch. She climbed up in that oven and gave birth to those puppies. But you know what? That does not make those puppies biscuits just because they're born in, in an oven. They're still puppies. Is that fair enough? So being born to in a Christian nation does not make you a Christian. Joining a church, shaking a preacher's hand, signing a piece of paper, being dunked or baptized or sprinkled, all those things, nothing, none of that matters. Jesus said you must be born again. You must be born again. Now, the role of the army of God that's coming with him the army's made up of, as we talked about last time, made up of saints and angels, a strange army because they will not fight. All of the fighting will be done by our commander-in-chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when I ride that, ride horse, that white horse back with Jesus, I may be surrounded by angels. I don't know. I hope you're there. I hope we're going together. I hope we're riding. You want to go horseback riding? Come on, let's go. we got white horses. All right? What an, what an interesting, unusual army this will be. But we're part of that. And John says that the role of the army of saints and angels will be to bring glory to the Lord and to admire the Lord Jesus Christ. For whatever reason, he's chosen to take us with him. He didn't say, you guys wait up here in heaven for me. I'm going to go down, execute judgment, set up my earthly kingdom for a thousand years, and then y'all come and visit me. No, 
He wants us to accompany him to this tremendous battle. He wants us to see the glory of the Lord. He wants us to experience for ourselves what the powerful word of God is coming out of his mouth. Because when he issues forth that, what John called a sword out of his mouth, it destroys his enemies. It lays them out. Every king, every mighty man, every army, every fighting, every soldier, every tank, every, every uh, rocket propelled grenade, every, every weapon, every, every gun, Every grenade, all of it's going to be wiped out by the voice of the Lord when he just speaks. How powerful is his word? Last week, I think it was, or one of these times, I told you about the power of God when he said, let there be light. When, Jesus, when God the Father spoke and said, let there be light, there was light. I said, there was light. And that light has continued now to create in our solar system, in our galaxy, something like 100 billion stars with a B, billion with a B. And uh, each of those stars is like our sun. Uh, the sun that we, we love in summertime and wish we could see more of in wintertime is 93 million miles away, our sun. But our sun is simply a star. It's mere, there, there are some stars much larger than our sun. Our sun has nine planets revolving around it. You count Pluto, you count all of those. Nine planets who revolve around that sun, that star. They think now that perhaps all of the stars, 100 billion, have planets surrounding them. They have moons and they have Saturns and have, we wouldn't call them that, Mercury and Mars and all these things. We don't, wouldn't necessarily call them all that, uh, but, but they do. They have, and so, so what I'm saying to you is God's creative ability and power in his word is absolutely beyond human comprehension. When, G, when God said, let there be light, that, light begin, that word began to create light. And now through, uh, uh, I read just the other day of a new telescope that is replacing the Hubble telescope. The Hubble was launched in the 90s and the, the Hubble's what helped us to discover 100 billion uh, stars in our galaxy. Now they're beginning to understand that there, there are other galaxies in our universe that perhaps are, are as large as ours, and there are 200 billion of these galaxies. So, so if 200 billion of them have 100 billion stars each, and every star has its own planets, it's just mind-blowing. I'm telling you what is absolutely <coughs> uncomprehensible for us to understand how great the Word of the Lord is. Amen. So out of his mouth now, out of his mouth, this is the authority of Christ. Let's talk about it. Verse 15 of Revelation 19, okay? We're in Revelation 19. Scripture says, blessed is he who speaks this word out to others, and blessed are those who hear it, blessed are those who read it. The only book in the Bible that has this promise of blessing. We're being blessed today. I tell you what, God's blessing your life today simply because you're hearing the words from Revelation. Now out of his mouth, verse 15, goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. Now the nations who we're talking about here are what I call the armies of the Antichrist, all right? This is at the end of a seven-year period of time that we call the Great Tribulation. Let me quickly give you a time frame. We're living in the dispensation of grace, the church age. It began with Calvary, Jesus offering his life's blood. That was the hope that God gave to the world. God has exercised mercy and grace now over 2,000 years. Here we are. But guess what? Man has rejected it. Man has rejected it. Man has rejected it. And now we're living in an age that is just like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. We're living in a culture that is just like it was in the days of Noah. Jesus said, that's the sign of my second coming is when you see, you look around you and you see people living as they were living in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, read about it. God says, I, I, repent, I repent. I mean, I just, I'm, I regret, I guess is what I would say. I, I, I wish I hadn't even made this people. Their minds and their hearts are on evil continuously. They don't care about me. I created all this for them, but they don't even have time to call upon me. And they're worshiping all kinds of false gods. They've got all kinds of priorities that are not right. They're serving evil things or doing evil things with their bodies and their minds and their families. And everybody's involved in evil. It's just evil continuously. And God said, I'm going to destroy an entire civilization. And he did it with the flood. 
Wow. So the nations then, I don't know how I got off on that, although it was kind of fun getting there. The nations that are mentioned in this verse, if you guys can bring up Revelation 19, 15, please. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. The nations. Everybody say the nations. The word nations is ethnos or eth, 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 from which we get the word ethnic or ethnicity. So it's more of a people group than it is a geopolitical uh, nation. More people groups than it is uh, bordered uh, nations. As a matter of fact, uh, by the time the Antichrist gets through leading uh, seven years of tribulation, the one world government is already established and set up and he's leading it. How many of you have been reading lately about the New World Order? Anybody? Are you staying up to speed on that stuff? I hope you are. First time I ever heard it mentioned was George uh, Bush the first. He talked about it publicly, how we're going to establish a new world order. Well, this is nothing new. Globalists have been looking to do this uh, since the days of, of uh, Nimrod in the Tower of Babel. <laughs> That's what they were trying to do. Let's all unite ourselves and we'll build a tower it would be like God. If there really is a God up there, we'll take him down off his throne. But we're going to build a tower of worship. On every level of that ziggurat, there was, there was uh, altars of worshiping uh, false gods and demon gods and so forth and so on. The higher you got, the more, uh, more pagan it became. And so, so the whole thought, Nimrod, this mighty hunter, that's what his name means, this gatherer of men, was gathering people to himself. And they were building this culture and building this society and building this civilization that had absolutely no room for God. They were going to reject God and everything he stood for. And God comes down. What does he do? He confuses their language. Instead of all speaking one language, he gives everybody their own language. Now all of a sudden the guy's, he's hollering for more bricks. And he's like, throw those bricks up here to me. And the guy down below says, Que pasa, senor? <laughs> no comprende. <laughs> I know that was poor Spanish, but you get the thought. <laughs> you get the thought. All of a sudden, now there's no ability to communicate. Because why? Because these ethnic, group, ethnic groups, these people groups, had come together, and they had in intended to, to worship uh, themselves and not God, and they were going to set themselves up as God. From the days of, of, of Adam and Eve in the garden, the serpent, the devil says to Eve, you know, God doesn't want you to eat of this tree because he knows that when you eat the tree, you will become like him. She's like, really? Become like God? I like the thought of that. Sounds good. The lust of her flesh, the lust of her eyes, the pride of life. Three forms of temptation used against Jesus in the wilderness when Satan came to him. Same three. We read about those three in the book of 1 John uh, the second chapter, he lays them out for us, what those three forms of temptation are. And trust me, that's the same forms of temptation the devil uses against you and I. 5,000 years later of human history, and he doesn't have any new tricks. He's still using the same forms of temptation against us, and we're still falling for it. And now we find our culture in an absolute abyss, an absolute quagmire, an absolute sewer of filth and garbage and, 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 and stuff that should not even be uttered and should not even be talked about. But what we do is we not only allow it in our culture, we celebrate those who do it. We clap our hands and we, we commemorate them and we, we set them on a pedestal and we, we buy their books and we go to their movies. We celebrate them. We go to their concerts. We lift our hands as if we were worshiping in their concerts. We listen to that music and we, we're filled with the lyrics and we're filled with the, with the, with the music itself. And we're under the false anointing of the, the powers of hell. I'm telling you, friend, listen, it's time for Christians to listen to God and clear your mind and get right with God and get back to a holy living and trusting him before it's too late. He's coming back again. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Revelation 19 and 15, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. What power is there in the words of, of, of the mouth of Jesus and his words? Whew, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. Now, I don't know what John saw. He wrote down the very best. He tried to describe it as best he could. And um, he calls it a sharp sword. I was visiting with, with Skyler a couple weeks ago. We were talking about this, this passage and said, Pastor, remember, the sword is the word of God. Remember in Ephesians 6? Uh, we're to put on the armor of God and take the, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I said, that's it, absolutely. 
So he's speaking the word of God. And the word of God has such power in it. Such incredible might that all these armies that have gathered, they've come down from Russia, they come over from Turkey, Syria is in on the thing. Uh, 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 some of the African nations are in on the thing. Uh, and there's, there's Lebanon. Well, Lebanon doesn't have much to talk about nowadays. But, but you've got Jordan and you've got Egypt and you've got all of these other uh, Saudi Arabia. You've got all these Middle Eastern countries full of Arabs. They outnumber the Jews 600 to 1. And they're absolutely, their purpose and their, their desire is to push Israel off into the Mediterranean and absolutely annihilate them. That's why Hamas exists. That's why Hezbollah exists. Listen, that's why the Palestinian Liberation Org Organization lives, the PLO. Listen, we're supporting these people, and we're backing these people, and we're, we're applauding these freedom fighters who are coming against Israel because these Israelis have come in here, and they're occupying the land that really belongs to these people, and it's a shame, isn't it horrible, and we need to do something about it. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's boycott Israel. Let's just not buy anything from Israel, and let's not send them any money, and let's not be their friend, and let's turn our back on them. Listen, God says in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those that bless you, but I'm going to curse those who curse you. So we as a nation need to keep our nose clean and, and, not, bless, and not curse Israel. Thank God that, that Jerusalem has now been announced by our president as the eternal capital of the Jewish people. That's, he's only speaking the truth. Thank God he's now moved the, the embassy uh, from Tel Aviv down to Jerusalem where it belongs, the capital city. That, and he's not only telling the truth, he's only doing what the past five presidents were supposed to do. Thank God for that support for Israel. I don't know if you read recently, but there's a new, a brand new peace treaty that's been signed by Israel and the United Arab Emirates. The folks, um, folks who, who are, are part of that nation. And uh, United Arab Emirates is one of the richest uh, of the Middle Eastern nations and one of the most progressive. And now they have a treaty with Israel that just, man, it really looks good. It looks fantastic. And they all signed it. Jared Kushner was involved in the preparation of that treaty. He was also involved in the preparation of the treaty between uh, Israel and the, Palis the Palestinians that the Palestinians refused to sign. It was going to give them, it was going to benefit them like, I don't know, $50 billion or some huge crazy number. And they said, no, no. We will not acknowledge Israel as a state. We will not uh, declare that we're going to stop terrorism against Israel. Doesn't matter how much money you give us, we're not going to do it. So they didn't sign. Jared Kushner. You remember Jared, the Jewish son-in-law of Donald Trump, married to Ivanka? He was involved. He was like the point man in these negotiations. <laughs> Keep your eye on Jared. <laughs> I'll just stop at that. Keep your eye on Mr. Kushner. <laughs> I don't know if anybody in this room knows it, but he had a, he, he and his company, uh, they took over from his dad. He's, he's built it now to quite a real estate magnet. That's what he is. Mag magnate? Yeah. Anyway. He, he, he bought a building for $1.8 billion in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue, and the address is 666 Fifth Avenue. <laughs> I just thought that was interesting. Pastor, are you trying to read something in there? Nope, 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 nope. I'm not trying to read anything in there. But I'm telling you what, there's going to come a man. Well, now my intent to get in the Antichrist. I need to talk about the Antichrist next week or the week after. But, but there's going to come a man who will be so persuasive and so powerful that the nations of the world will follow him. And he will come into a world where, I, I believe he's already living, I believe he's already probably in power somewhere, some nation. And um, he, will, he will come to power when he does. Uh, the one world government, government will already be in place. The globalists will have convinced all of us to erase our borders, eradicate our borders like Europe did. I mean, look at the European Union. They're no longer eight or 10 un, uh, nations, they're one. They're unified, man. They're the, they're the European Union. They, they've got one, one currency, the euro. They have the borders can be crossed as if they did not exist. You can travel from country to country to country if you so desire. And uh, so they're now, they're now, by banding together, they're this huge financial power. And so it looks really, really good what they've done. It's very enticing. It would be very enticing for us to eradicate our borders. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people that want us to, to not protect our borders and let anybody in that wants to come in. Uh, I don't believe that's correct. I believe if you're going to be a nation, you've got to have some borders. You've got to have sovereignty. And so I thank God for the present administration who has the same mindset that I do. 
And um, because, you know, my mindset's right. I'm, I got the right opinion and the right attitude. I'm glad to see some politician that agrees with me, Rex. <laughs> it's about time, ain't it? <laughs> oh, my. So we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the Antichrist uh, in the next couple of weeks or so. And, but he's, but he's, suffice it to say he has gathered these armies and he's convinced these armies. Now he's broken his treaty with Israel after three and a half years. Um, he's broken this peace deal. He's established himself, himself as the object of worship in the third Jewish temple. The temple will be rebuilt. I don't know if the temple will be rebuilt before we're raptured out or after we're raptured out. Doesn't matter. All I know is the Bible teaches it's going to be rebuilt. It has to be rebuilt because the Antichrist goes into the Holy of Holies, and uh, they establish an image uh, to himself. And he commands men and women, young people, great and small, to bow and worship the image. By the way, while you're bowing and worshiping the image, our one world economy requires that you get a stamp, some kind of a mark, either on your forehead, or if you don't want it for cosmetic reasons, get it in your hand, your right hand or your forehead, you will receive a mark. I don't know if anybody's been watching these... uh, uh, radio, uh, let's see, what's the word there? ID, it's, uh, uh, it's an identification chip, it's a little tiny microscopic chip, and they can inject it through a needle whoop, into your body. And uh, we've been seeing this in science fiction movies for a long time, haven't we? Uh, and so anyway, now it's no longer science fiction, it's real, and so people are getting chipped, because after all, if I have my financial information in a chip that you can read when I go to the su- supermarket, and you just whoop, beep it, like you do barcode, and then that takes that money out of my account, and I walk out with my groceries. No one can steal my money. No one can steal my identity. No one can take my credit card. I'm not using credit card. I'm, I, this is part of the cashless society. Has anyone recently been to a business, and they've told you that they have no coins, they have a shortage of coins now? And so I've, I, numerous times, I've gone through a drive through somewhere, and uh, they said, do you want your pennies? And I'm like, yeah, I'd like my pennies, please. And I'll get my pennies. Other places, they just don't give you the penny, and they just give you the receipt and move on. I'm like, I think she was supposed to give me a penny. Wow, what's happening? We have a, supposedly we have a coin shortage. Charlie, I don't know if we really do or not, but that's what they're telling us. We now have a coin shortage. We need to get to the place where we have a cashless society. After all, I mean, I mean, how many, how many of us in this room don't use cash anymore? Hardly ever. Now, I do because I'm 63. I'm an old school, and I want cash in my pocket, so I'll know it's there. Well, I'll tell you something. My kids, the next generation, they use a, they use a debit card. And, uh, but debit cards can be stolen. So why don't we come up with a way to put a chip under your skin, in your body, that has all of your financial information in it? By the way, let's put all your health information in it. If you're in a car wreck and, and you're about to die and you have, a, you have something like a, a, a tuberculosis or you have a... Um, let's bring it down a little more, diabetes, you have some condition or heart condition, and you're laying there passed out, and they don't know what to do. Somebody, the doctor or ER people or the EMP people, they just scan your, your thing, and it says, oh, this person's diabetic, and this person has high blood pressure. You know all of that in an instant. So, my goodness, why shouldn't we chip everybody? Come on, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Hello? It's preparing us for the day when the Antichrist rules, one man rules all the, all the nations of the world, all the peoples of the world, all the finances of the world. One man is in charge. And I want to tell you something. You will not be able to buy or sell or get a job or survive without the mark. It's called the mark of the beast. You'll know the number of the na- name of the man is number 600, three score and six. That's his number. Now, Ever since I've been a little boy, people have been trying to figure out who 666 is. I mean, they've figured out ways to make Adolf Hitler 666, you know. And uh, we, all, all kinds of things, you know, like that. And, but, but that's, that, I don't know about all that. I do know there's a man living, already living. I think we're so close to the coming of the Lord, the rapture, the, the, the second advent, that we're so close. I personally believe that the man of perdition, the man of lawlessness, the antichrist, just anti means opposite or in the place of, in the place of Christ, Antichrist, um, I believe he's already living. I believe he's already in some kind of a power position in a nation, probably a European nation, uh, even as we speak right now. Right now. I wish I had time to, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get the quotes. I will pull the quotes into my sermon when I start putting the Antichrist sermons together. 
and I'll share some quotes with you that I have discovered from incredible leaders. I mean, we're talking people who are the head of the United Nations and like this for years, for decades, people have said, we will follow one man. If one man would just rise up, we would all follow one man if we had, if we had a crisis, if we just had, if the, if the right crisis happens in, America, in the world, we'll follow one man. If we just have the right crisis. Now, could this, could what we're walking through now, this, this coronavirus crisis, could this be a, a, per, a precursor to what will take place in the age I'm talking about? I believe it, I believe it will. And I believe that it is. So out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. Let me, let me wrap this up here. In 1915, he himself will rule with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 1.16, he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. If you've ever been near the equator in the summertime, you discovered the sun shining in all of its strength. I love to go to the Philippines. I've been there a number of times, as you know, and, and to visit our, our missionaries and, and minister and preach and do what I can do. And I'm telling you what, that's about as close to the equator as I want to get. <laughs> that sun burns this little blonde-headed boy's skin every time I get in it. Well, this is what you're going to see when the Lord Jesus comes. His countenance will shine like the sun in its strength. Revelation 118. So when the Lord returns a second time, he strikes the nations with a sharp sword of his mouth, a symbol representing an instrument of war with which Christ will smite the nations and establish absolute rule. Psalm 2, 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So when Jesus returns the second time, he fully, he fully fulfills this prophecy of Isaiah, which we often quote at Christmas time. It's Isaiah 9 and 6. You know how it goes. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. A child is born, but a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. At his first coming, Jesus fulfilled the first part of the prophecy. A child was born. But at his second coming, it will be fulfilled and the government will at last be upon his shoulders. You know, we have tried in, in our culture, in our society, as long as we've been around, we've tried to govern ourselves. We've tried to um, rule and we've tried to control. We've tried to make it happen. And uh, every nation has struggled with that. Every nation has fallen. We're so blessed in America because we have a, Democrat, we have a Demo democratic republic. And it is absolutely, in my opinion, the, the finest form of government. It's government for the people, by the people, of the people. It's not perfect. We got, we got a swamp in Washington, unfortunately. But it is the best system out there. Much better than any other system. But I'm telling you, no matter how good the system, how good the people, it's utter failure to govern ourselves. The United Nations was established in 1945 to put an end to war. We'll bring all the nations of the world together in one room and we'll sort all the problems and we'll solve the problems and we'll have world peace. But they missed something. They didn't make room for Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, at their table. So since 1945 till now, there have been more wars, conflicts, international conflicts, than we've had in the previous 4,000 years. Why is that? Because man cannot govern himself. We need Jesus to come and take the government of this world on his shoulders and rule as king of kings from the new Jerusalem. And that's going to happen one of these days, and I'm glad to be a part of it. If you're glad, say amen. 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 Stay with me, please, everybody. You've been sitting a long time. I'd like to keep you another hour and a half, but I better not. Nobody brought lunch, so we'll break here. We'll pick it up next time. Don't forget, Wednesdays now, you can, you can jump in here with me, and uh, we're, we're teaching along this line. On Wednesdays, we've discovered the beauty of a green screen, and we're having a lot of fun with that, aren't we, Sabrina? <laughs> so there's no telling where you're going to find me. You might find me on a beach next time we do it. I don't know. 
green screen, in case you don't know, you stand in front of a green screen and something about the camera, the video camera, it enables you to put any kind of image you want behind you. That's how the weathermen do it on, your, on TV. You know, they have this big map of the, and stuff. They change the maps, go back and forth. That's just a green screen. They're actually looking at a monitor, in case you didn't know. Well, we're green screening some of our Wednesday night teachings. And so she's put me, I'm in a whole lot of different places, but it's fun. It's, it's exciting. This is an exciting time. I'm thankful to be able to teach the Word of God and teach you this morning a little bit about the, first, the second coming of the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me, please? <clears throat> God, you are good. You are so, so very good. In all my life, all of our lives, you have been faithful. You've never broken a promise. <laughs> oh, God, I love you, Lord. I thank you for your faithfulness your immutability, the fact that you never change. <laughs> You're not like humans. We, we change our minds. We, 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 we waver. We, we're up and we're down and we're in and we're out. But not so with you, God. You're stable and secure. And you're good. You're always good. And we're thankful to be born in this time. We're thankful for grace, Lord, that we can receive your grace in time of need and we're able to confess our sins and be cleansed, be made whole. But I realize, Lord, there are a lot of our friends and our family who cannot enjoy what we enjoy because they're not saved, they're not born again. Today, Lord, our heart goes to them. Right now, our mind, in our minds, we're thinking of our loved ones who are lost. We're thinking of men and women, teenagers, nieces and nephews and grandchildren. Oh, God. Oh God, if you don't, something doesn't happen, they're going to miss the rapture. They're going to be stuck here through the tribulation and then the judgment of God. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. Help them, we pray. Give us, give us a word of witness. Give us a message to share in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you're here this morning and you have a loved one or friend who's lost and you want us just to agree together right now in prayer, would you slip your hand up right where you're standing? What we're saying is I have a loved one, I have a friend, someone I'm working with, somebody that's close to me. Yeah, 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 everywhere. It's just about all of us. Just about all of us. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. <clears throat> Father, we bless you now. We thank you now, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray for them right now, would you? Lord, we lift up our loved ones. We lift up our friend. We're asking you for a supernatural miracle in their life. Send someone across their path, Lord, who will share a word of witness, uh, something on television, some internet, uh, something they read, some, some, some paper somewhere, some book somewhere, Lord. Touch them, God, we pray. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Let's sing together. All my life you I've have been, been faithful. faithful. Yes, you have, Lord. All, all my, my life. life have been so, so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God come on let's lift our hands Lord heaven and sing it again all my life you have been faithful yes Lord <laughs> all my life have been so, so, so good. good with every breath, breath I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. God. Sing it again. Come on, let's sing it again. All my life, you have been faithful. Yes, Lord. All my life. Of the goodness, goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of my God. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, you're faithful and good. We bless you. We love you, Jesus. 
We bless you. We love you, Jesus. One thing I want to ask of our family here at Life Community before we give the blessing and go home, I want to ask you to um, look around. If you see someone who's normally here, they're not here, would you check up on them with, for me? Would you do that? Just give them a phone call, shoot them a text, catch them on Facebook or something. Tell them they were missed. Just say, hey, I missed you Sunday. Hey, how are things going? A lot of folks are still um, really nervous about getting around the crowd so they don't come to service, to church service. We understand uh, for some folks, you're, you know, if you're elderly or you're physically, you just have some things that cause you to be compromised and easily catch a virus or something. We understand. We understand. But I'm going to tell you something. If you can go to work, you can go to school, you can go to Walmart, if you can't come to church, I don't understand. I just don't. So, so, so I'm busy contacting folks. I need you to help me. Would you do that? We've got a great MVP program. We do ministry, visitation, and prayer. Those folks are they're reaching out to. And so so let's let's just touch base with folks and tell them they're loved. Will you do that? Don't tell them the thing about Walmart. Nope. <clears throat> Don't do that. Although my wife's bumped into a lot of people at Walmart lately. <laughs> and anyway, all right. <laughs> Moving right along. I love you. I'm so glad you're here today. Without you, it would be very empty in here and very boring. Trust me. And so we're so honored that you've come. And uh, Charlie and Brenda from Tecumseh area. And Rex and Tiffany all the way from Henrietta, Texas. Man, are you wearing, are you wearing boots yet? You started back with your boots? Not yet. Oh, I'm glad you're here today. My goodness sakes. Pam is here. And Nathan and... and uh, Young lady, Cassidy, yeah, came with Jeff and Sherry. You guys, thank you from Texas. Amen. I'm so glad you're with us today. All right, let's raise our hand for the blessing of the day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And give you peace. May angels go before you. The goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit.